Hello and welcome to an all-new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your unarmed hosts. I am John. And I'm CC, and this is the show where John talks about anime and I contribute half-witty commentary. <laughs> now <laughs> hold on well a second. Be, I mean, maybe not in the other episode, but for this one, that might actually be the case, because today John will review not one, not two, but three series, kinda. First he will do a rom-com double feature, comparing the two series just because, and... Our love has always been 10 centimeters apart, I think is the title. Yeah, I mean, let's be real. Uh, it could probably be a triple play, but we're going to you know, break it up in the middle a bit. For sanity's sake, probably. Yours yeah. and the audience's. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, after that, I'll take over for a short while and talk about the full CG anime fairy tale Land of the Lustrous. And finally, John will wrap up this episode with his review of... Uh, Blend S and its wild maid cafe shenanigans. Uh, I get to meme it up a bit today. And in the next season, probably with Pop Team Epic. Anyway, hell yeah. That's, that's a lot of anime to talk about today. So, strap in, folks. We'll be right back. Right, so I, I guess I get to talk about two shows at once because I wasn't really sure how to separate it otherwise because. Hey, I'm going to be going on about several rom-coms today, two of which are basically teen high school romance stories. A little less uh, calm than rom, to be honest. But uh, And then after you said the la <laughs> in the previous episode that maybe you're done with teen rom-coms. <laughs> I mean, probably for the time being, because this is... We obviously talk about one season ahead of where we currently yeah, are. Cause sure. I'm I, just bust, I, <laughs> busting your balls, dude. <laughs> I mean, let's look at it this way. I think this season I'm only watching one or two slice of life shows. So, a. So, I guess I'll. I, I'm going to be honest with everyone listening. I didn't think of how to sort of combine these two discussions so i'll like talk about them separately at first i guess and then what i thought was stronger in one than the other uh Sounds good so first let's uh, talk about just because so as another school year begins drawing to a close uh you know the third year high school students are moving steadily towards their next milestone graduation of course when going to either entering the workforce or going to college. Among them are uh, Mio Natsume. She's uh, this uh, girl who's burdened with these lingering feelings about uh, past uh, romance. She's like, you know, top of her class, that sort of character. We know the type. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got Kazuki Morikawa. He's, uh, she's a member of the concert band. But she's distant from the other people in her life because she has to take care of her younger siblings. She's very motherly. Uh, we've got Haruto Soma, who's uh, very athletic, and he just wants to be the best uh, baseballer that can be. And uh, we have Ena Komiya, who is super obsessed with photography and she wants to restore uh the school's uh photography club to its former glory uh because it doesn't have many members it's going to get disbanded um so one of the teachers says hey if you can bring home an award uh we'll let the club keep running is so, that the only thing <laughs> among other things mm. um but yeah these this group the don't have a, initially have a connection amongst one another, but when this one kid, Eita Izumi, uh, transfers back into this school uh, because he hasn't been able to stay in one place for very long because of his family moving around, uh, he sort of becomes the catalyst for all these characters coming together and getting to know each other. Um, and he, uh, was friends with Haruto once upon a time, had a thing in, a uh, Mio in him. There was like a, uh, love triangle between the three sort of dealy going on. Uh, the show sort of obviously fleshes that out a bit more than I am right now. I'm just glossing over it for the mm. sake of getting through my summary. Um, but yeah, uh, this his reappearance sort of 
sparks the rekindling of these old relationships that, you know, had started to sort of drop off. Um, but, you know, graduation is a cause of anxiety for all students. And when Ada comes back, uh, all their the carefree days, as it were, sort of come to an end because, you know, long forgotten memories, deeply buried emotions, and sp- inspiring new passions. Everything is brought to light in their bittersweet final semester. Mm-hmm. I thought um, the show, it, it starts off pretty interesting and pretty strong. Um because, because, you know, you have this diverse cast of characters, each of which, you know, ha- definitely has uh, their own interests and goals and objectives. And just the way that, you know, you wouldn't think that they would all come together. It, it's one of those stories that, hey, one extra person into the mix really can, you know, make that difference. And I thought, you know, if this and uh, the other story we're going to talk about next after this, they felt very grounded. And I appreciate that because, you know, e- even though with a lot of these team romance shows, we talk about at length with oh, drama and misunderstandings, you know, there's a little bit of that, but it's not, it's not overly played out or tropey like, you know, our, <laughs> our favorite whipping boy gamers. Yeah, that's not what it felt like. I I mean, I only watched the first episode, but, you know, it, it felt like a very, I don't want to say somber, but it felt like a very, like you already said, grounded, rooted in reality, teenager story, like coming of age story. What The other thing that stood out to me uh, in the first episode was just how beautiful it looked. Yeah, about that. The, it doesn't stay that way, uh, <laughs> judging from your words <laughs> or your tones. This show, it has these amazingly beautiful moments in the animation. And it looks great. Like, the first episode and a few of the episodes after that are really good show pieces. Like, there's, um, in the first episode, uh, Eita and Haruto are down in the baseball field. You know, Eita's pitching and Haruto is at bat. And that whole sequence, look, it looks incredible and it's great. Yeah. It's really good and there was a lot of it there's a lot of production issues apparently so that's why the show is kind of on a sliding scale of quality and it's really unfortunate because i thought i after coming from we have to go back to gamers again because this it was also produced by the same studio pine jam uh gamers looked good I, i you know I'm not going to take that away from it. It looked good. It had really good production. It's one of the few good things I can say about that show for myself. So. Yeah. But this was, I don't know. I don't know exactly what happened with it, which is unfortunate because, you know, it had these, you know, like I said, beautiful moments. And then in the, you could turn around the next moment. And it was like a whiplash. Like, what? Ow. Huh? Mm-hmm. So really off model characters or janky animation or stiff animation or what was what was the worst standout in that regard where you would say, Oh Jesus Christ, this is going downhill. There was some jank there were some moments of jank in there. A little bit of off model, not like offensively so, but it was noticeable. Okay. Was it a continual continuous downslope at a certain point, or was it just you know an up and down like it was kind of up and down as it went along. Okay. Well, does it end on the strong note, or...? Yeah, that it does, at least. So okay, that's good. I will, I will say, as far as um, the ending goes, this is not on the production team's part, but more on Amazon's part. <sighs> Amazon and... Ant- th- you know what? I'm glad Anime Strike is no longer a thing because that means some of these shows can get better homes on Crunchyroll, on High Dive, wherever else. Because there's this poignant scene in the last episode where a couple of the characters have um, a conversation on their cell phones and they didn't subtitle any of it. Mm. And it's like, it's like you think you think this is important. When, when, especially when they did it for the rest of the show, but not for that. So, hmm. I don't, I, I don't understand Amazon. 
But it seems like even Amazon doesn't understand Amazon, or at least am Anime Strikes. So <laughs> yeah, now it's real, gone. Yeah, it made me real glad when I uh, logged in one morning to for watch, I forget what show. And, oh, the Anime Strike channel is gone. And then five minutes later, getting an email from Amazon saying, yeah, about that. See you later. Yeah, the show, if you can put aside some the sliding scale of quality, you know, at least told an interesting story with interesting characters. I guess this is kind of an accelerated uh, review just because, you know, try and fit two into one block. So yeah, sure. I, I guess we can talk a little bit about the staff. It's a little bit of a shorter list. Um, this, it was directed by Atsushi Kobayashi, who, who I guess this was uh, his first uh, directorial experience. And that might be the reason why the show had its ups and downs. I don't know. You know, obviously, uh, one person does not a whole production make as, you know, mm. we talked last time with uh, MMO Junkie. Side note. Apparently, uh, he was fired from a Signal MD, so you can enjoy MMO Junkie uh, guilt-free now. Yay. All right. <laughs> There's something. <laughs> but yes, uh, just because it's directed by Atsushi Kobayashi, he's done episode director work on stuff like uh, Blood Sea, Gargantia on the Verdant Planet, uh, Genshin 2, Girls and Panzer. So he's worked on, you know, at least some high-profile stuff. A lot of the scripting was done by Hajime Kamoshida, who's also done some pretty big-name stuff like uh, Gundam Iron Blooded Orphans, The Pet Girl of the Sakura Dorm, and uh, Selector Infected Wick Sauce, mm. which I still haven't watched it, but I'm kind of interested in because it sounds like it's Yu-Gi-Oh, but with some, like, Faustian shit going on. The name is just so ridiculous to me. Yeah, I guess there's another season of it coming up, too. I wonder how ridiculous the name is going to be on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the summary sounds interesting. That's that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's not many um, shows that you could say that they're the Madoka Magica of card games. <laughs> 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 I mean, not even Yu-Gi-Oh! is like that, except for, you know, the... Um, or a Calco Sark, but that's the one everyone hates, apparently. So, oops, sorry. And uh, the music was done by uh, Nagi Yanagi, and she's done a whole bunch of stuff. Her music is incredible. She's worked on stuff like, I guess, the uh, the recent Berserk series, Black Bullet, uh, Dangan Ronpa Three, specifically the Despair Arc, uh, Heroic Legend of Arslan, Kino's Journey, uh, Lull in the Sea. Teen rom-com snafu, the second half of Seraph of the End. So if you're familiar with the works on any of those that, you know, she has had a part in, then, you know, you're you're in for a treat as far as the music goes. And as, uh, as far as that goes, you know, it was a really good soundtrack that gave a, a lot of the mo – that really helped solidify a lot of the moments that were happening in the show. So, Speaking of Seraph of, of the End, there's a show that's – you for a new season yeah it is <laughs> really maybe maybe after wit studio is done with uh the next season of attack on titan yeah maybe we'll see <laughs> yeah they are they are very busy at the moment not only attack on titan but also ancient mega sprite and uh in uh, the, uh, the next pokemon movie too yeah and right now they're work uh, they they work uh, on um after the rain i think so yeah they got a lot of projects on their hands. <laughs> I don't know when they'll get to uh, Sarah off the end again, but I'm looking forward to whenever they do. I guess uh, I'll transition towards 10 centimeters, and then we'll, I'll try and do my best on a compare and contrast. Mm -hmm. Our love has always been 10 centimeters apart is about uh, this boy, Haruki Sarizawa, and this girl, Mio Aida. They met under the cherry blossom tree at Sakura Gaoka, high school and ever since that day you know they've sort of been making eyes at each other but they can't really seem to figure out how to close the gap hence you know always 10 centimeters apart you get it it's cute and you know it's a little bit more simple and concise of a story but uh it has its fair share of drama and character development like uh Mio feels like she has trouble getting close to Haruki because at one point, like several years before the story, uh, Haruki's older brother saves her 
from this accident. Uh, but then not as a direct result of it, but he ends up passing away sometime later on. So, you know, there's, you know, the teen guilt and angst and whatnot. And, you know, hard to not feel guilty about that sort of thing. I guess I could see why someone might feel that way. Um, and Haruki is, well, they're both uh, sort of big into the arts. Haruki, uh, Haruki is all about film, and he wants to go to America to, for film school and become a director. And sure, cool. Uh, Mio is big on painting and wants to become an art teacher. So they're sort of on the same track but in different directions. So the fact that they sort of run parallel like that make, makes them interesting. The real interesting thing about this show is that it's only six episodes long. Oh, really? Yeah. It sort of started mid-season. Like, I remember it being announced and being like, oh, uh, it's it's being animated by Laidus. And I don't think we've had a chance to talk about them at length. Not much, no. Because they've done other sort of cool stuff. Like, I, I know... I know I have gone on at length about how much I love Classroom Crisis, <laughs> and that was the first full-length show. That you show have. That, <laughs> that was the first full-length show that they really got to work on, and it's a super good show, and why haven't any of you watched it yet? <clears throat> they, also <laughs> they also worked on They also worked on Magi, the Inventor of Sinbad, which is also really, really good. I mean, it sort of expects you to have watched the other two series yeah. first. But yeah, it's a it's a prequel, but uh, mm. I, watching it without complete, you know, without completely without knowledge of uh, of you know the Magi universe uh, can get you can leave you a bit confused, maybe. Mm. So yeah, I would recommend watching uh, proper Magi first before touching that one. Yeah, one of my friends, uh, I th I think it's on Netflix. He says, oh, I started to watch it, and I was really lost. I was like, yeah, there's two shows you need to watch before it. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Still a good show, though. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, this show ran six episodes, and I feel like it was stronger for it because it helped them definitely to maintain the level of quality and it kept the story more concise are the episodes normal standard anime length or are they a bit longer or yeah they're 22 23 minutes what you'd expect all right that's almost uh, like an like a prolonged ova maybe instead of instead of a series I yeah i could see you say planned. that yeah that i'm not sure about but um it, the interesting thing about this show is that um, it was conceived of by a group called Honeywork. Uh, Honeyworks is a musical group, and they started uh, in about 2010 making Vocaloid songs, and they had like a big major debut in 2014. Uh, they had these two songs that they wrote called um, I've Always Liked You in the Moment You Fall in Love. Those are important because the story told the stories told in those songs were expanded upon and made into not really full length movies but like short movies of the same name mm -hmm. and they kind of tie in to this show as you oh. know they're like they're like alternate stories which is pretty neat um this is like an unusual approach to, uh, I, I guess, a cross-media uh, experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, it, it, there's basically three different pairs of characters, and as you might imagine with the story, you know, they sort of all get married off to one another. Um, but each one is sort of about a different pairing, and this is the one that's about Haruki and Mio, like I said earlier. Mm -hmm. So... I'm surprised that they didn't make it a third, like, movie, as it were. And this, they're about maybe an hour long. I hesitate to call it a movie when it's, you know, shorter than 90 minutes. That's just something in my mind. I don't know. Yeah, but it, but it feels like it. It feels like maybe this was, in concept, like, created as, a, as you know, the third one of the bunch. And then... Mm. Uh, you know, split up into a series because either they wanted to try something new with it or they thought, yeah, maybe this story works better on an episode uh, episodic basis. 
But yeah, that's, get... that's really interesting. That's, uh, would you say, um, I mean, have you watched the, the other, uh, the short movies? Uh, not quite yet. I keep meaning to, and I keep putting it off. I got it. I really got to do it. To be honest with you, I learned about their existence after I started watching this. Well, get to back to me once you do, because I want to see if that enhan enhances the, or you know, enhances the experience on of this show, Paul's Watch, or if it expands the universe in a way, or you know, on the characters and stuff like that in, in a meaningful way, or if it's just you know, like maybe, ah, oh, okay, there's more from these people. That's that's also cool that you could watch when you, uh, if you enjoyed this the series. Yeah. Uh. So this, you know, the story behind this show's composition i guess you say it's it's structure that's a better word is pretty interesting compared to most of the other shows that we talk about it's because you know it ran half a season or i guess the cool kids say half a core some we of the still staff. haven't we still haven't really decided when the term core is more appropriate than season uh, yeah <laughs> so uh <laughs> Yeah, the word's still out on that. I mean, I guess you could say a show, a, sh a shoe, a really big shoe. A show is multiple cores when it spans more than one season. But also, you can have a second season that has like a continuing story, but that also has multiple cores because it has like a break in between and runs like in one part in fall season and one in spring season so yeah mm. <laughs> i don't know I, I feel like it's kind of an argument of semantics probably let's talk a little bit about the staff and then i'll do apples and oranges as best i can with two shows <laughs> uh so apparently got two directors got the chief director hitoshi nanbo who's worked on stuff like uh baki the grappler fairy tale the two uh fate grand order um shorts specials Bucky and the grappler there's a blast from the past yeah a very is. ugly blast from the past yeah it was <laughs> I, I remember looking at that and being like <sighs> at the characters and I, there was one other show that i sort of had the same reaction with and was also like a fighting anime and now it's not springing to mind but i can sort of see air master yes well i love that Master it. though but yeah, I remember looking at the character designs and that and being like, what the hell is going on? It was a mixed bag character wise, but it was a very fun show. <laughs> so I will I will go to war for for Air Master. I thought this is Fair enough. I mean I mean it's not underrated. I think people who watched it enjoyed it very much. But uh, yeah, I can see from the outside this is a this is a weird show, definitely. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh yeah, the other thing he worked on was a Hero Man. That's it. We want to get that in there too. Didn't did you watch that at some point? Oh, I did, and I loved it. I, I wish it had more seasons, but you know what can you do? Mm. But what I watched, I enjoyed. It was like a classic hero tale, bit of the Marvel Marvel formula sprinkled in because uh, Stan Lee was uh, one of the guys behind this. Oh yeah, yeah. And it was produced by Bones, so it looked really good. So oh. uh, yeah, it was a fun show. You know, not too much like big things happening in terms of story like, uh, like surprising things but it was enjoyable all the way through and uh, I wish it would have l run longer. Okay, alright. And then the uh, director of the show is uh, Takuro Tsugata who also worked on uh, one of the Fate Grand Order specials uh, Moonlight Lost Room. Man, some, we're going to have to have a discussion about some of the weird ass names that Fate has someday because, oh, damn. <laughs> Uh, he was an episode director on stuff like uh, Chaika, uh, Hero Academy, uh, uh, Noragami, Show by Rock, Snow White with the white with the white hair with the red hair. Mm -hmm. I can talk. I'm sorry, everyone. And a lot of the composition and script was done by a couple of different people. We got Yoshimi Narita, who's worked on pretty much everything. Pretty Cure. <laughs> In addition to that's a long I list. Yeah, it is. Like, I looked at the list. I was like, I don't need to write down all of these because he's worked on pretty much every single one. I don't know. Many, how many Pretty Cure series are there at this point? It's going to be there's, at least like there's seven? been like There's been like one a year for almost the past yeah. decade. 
I watched the first series of that and <laughs> that was enjoyable, but Jesus Christ, so many now. Uh, which which one did I watch all the way through? There was one that I watched a couple of years back, and then I think I started to watch the one after that because it had Yui Horii and she's one of my favorite voice actresses of all time, and then I ended up not finishing it because Precure doesn't get picked up by um, – anything unless your name is netflix and you change the name of it to glitter force because why not <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> i don't get it but whatever uh Hi- happiness charge precure that's the one i watched it's obviously a show with a very targeted audience but i'll tell you what in that show there were some amazingly animated moments like the last fight was like holy sh- this is a show for kids. It's awesome. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, even the first show, uh, the first series of that, even though it was still a lot more cartoony than the following uh, seasons, uh, had some pretty amazing fights, which I was surprised by because it was, you know, I, I I heard it was a magical girl show and I expected something on the level of Sailor Moon or stuff like that. And Pretty Cure has apparently always been like much more hands-on. Like it's very martial artsy. Mm. Uh, and yeah, that that was already already very apparent in the first season. It's like, holy shit, these girls cook ass. <laughs> I mean, I, I would like to go back and check out uh, a few of the other ones. Like, in particular, I wouldn't mind going back to Maho Girls Precure. Uh, I hear Heart Catch is pretty funny, and then Sweet Precure. But the thing is, these shows are commitments because they're like forty nine to fifty two episodes each ye- each year, and then there's usually a movie, and then there's this and that, and it's like you gotta slow down, please slow down. Yeah, and there's already so much anime out there. So, mm. but yeah, um, if you want another, if you want another uh, blast from the past, one of the things that uh, Narita helped write was beat the Vandal Buster. Oh Jesus fucking Christ! <laughs> I remember trying to watch that show and being like, wow, this is a thing. I watched way too much of that show. Like, not not completely till the end, but <laughs> at least 20 episodes or something, if not more. Yeah, that show yeah. was a long time, didn't it? Yeah, it did. It did. It, I think they were trying to go for something like, like Dragon Ball Length or something. I don't think they pulled it off completely, but just in terms of tone and everything, it really tried to dabble in that pool. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Didn't quite achieve it. <laughs> it always pre- felt very flat, but the character designs felt very, at least of the monsters, felt very Toriyama-ish. So mm. That's what attracted me in the first place. But once I realized this was going anywhere interesting, I got out. But that also that still took me way too long. <laughs> yeah, I forget uh, how much of the show I watched myself, but I kind of just started to lose interest. And I was like, all right, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh... Some of the other stuff I worked on is like, Saint <laughs> Seiya Omega, Twin Star Exorcists, uh, Wild Arms Twilight Venom, uh, and Zatch Bell. Uh, the other I wish I had finished uh, Zatch Bell. I enjoyed that. Or Konjiki no Gash Bell was the Japanese name. Yeah, uh, I couldn't. I, I saw the name and I was like, oh, I remember the show. I couldn't remember the Japanese name for the life of me. So thank you. <laughs> it was a, it was a cra- kind of weird kids show but it was it was enjoyable uh while i watched it for some reason i dropped off i don't remember why but what i saw of it i enjoyed i i watched a little bit of it when it was on cartoon network of all things Mm. i vividly remember there being a song about boobs and how jiggly they are which for a kids show yeah no but (laughs) it was interesting it was that stuck in my mind Chi 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 oh boy boing boing that's one of the <laughs> one of the lyrics I kid you not God, that that never left my mind <laughs> dig dug in and uh, is still there so I mean yeah. there's some things you just don't forget no <laughs> even if you want to maybe well yeah <laughs> sorry tangent <laughs> the other the other writer was uh keigo koyonagi who's worked on stuff like uh hanasaku iroha which one day i'll watch because i've watched all of the other pa works working girl shows and i'd like to watch that uh made in abyss yeah uh, great pet girl of sakura dorm sounds familiar we talked about it earlier uh and regalia which was a show that had its we i don't think we talked about it because um we wanted to, but 
it had did this weird thing where they aired the first four episodes, took it off the air because they felt like the production quality wasn't up to snuff. They brought it back. It looked better, but I'll tell you something. They need to spend a little more time in the writer's room with that show because the ending of it was like, what just yeah. happened? That's why I never picked it up again because I dropped off because of the stop. And then you picked it back up after it came back. And I, after a while, I was asking, like, and how is it turning out? And you were like, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, they were like, we wrote ourselves into a corner. What do? Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate answer. Yeah, it was. But yeah, uh, as you might imagine from what we talked earlier about Honeyworks, of course, they did the music for this show. Um, and some of their other credits are. Some show called Brothers Conflict, which I was reading about when I was writing my notes for this. And boy, that sure sounds like a thing. Uh, <laughs> Blue Spring Ride was another show. And then another one, which I think we both enjoyed to varying degrees, was Tokyo Ravens. Yes. Yeah. A flawed show, but uh, It's fun. still fun. It had, yes. That show had some amazing action sequences. It did. <laughs> but yeah, um... Between Just Because and uh, 10 Centimeters, I'm not going to say the full name out anymore. I sort of feel like I liked 10 Centimeters more simply because it it felt like it had the uh, resources to keep the quality up while, you know, staying interesting. But obviously Just Because has, you know, a larger cast with uh, more fleshed out characters simply because, you know, it is a longer show and they have more time to do more character development, which makes me wonder if because of, you know, the two movies that came before 10 centimeters, if they were able to do more character work on that and, you know, push uh, some of the side characters aside. That sounds wordy, but screw it <laughs> because they had already been established. I'm, I don't know. But it, eventually, okay. It, it sounded like the cast of uh, Just Because is also a lot bigger than the one in uh, 10 centimeters. So, yeah, 10 centimeters is basically the core six characters and their teacher. So, okay. So, it should have more leeway in terms of, you know, developing its characters, even though with a shorter runtime, just for, for the virtue of there being less characters. But yeah. you would s still say that there is, uh, you know, that it felt like there was a bit more devel development just because um, because it was du double the length. Yeah. And I mean, uh, the uh, it, it was a lot more fleshed out. And, you know, they did a lot more with the romance stuff. Like in 10 centimeters is very straightforward. Mm -hmm. And just because it's like... Uh, Oh, I used to have a crush on this character, but I don't anymore. But someone else has a crush on you. I'm not sure how I feel about that. You know, how 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 are you going to deal with this? And I will say that just because I had one of my favorite moments, because when they did the title drop so nonchalantly about eight episodes, and I was like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> that's great to hear. Uh, and they good. don't. They don't dangle like uh, a specific status quo in terms of its romance in front of your face for too long, right? No. Like, I mean, no. okay. So the characters <laughs> actually do, you know, the, the the relationships actually do develop, and it's not a constant will they, won't they? I mean, for Ata, it's sort of it's not really left on a hanging thread, but you know, it's inferred very heavily the direction it goes in, whereas mm -hmm. with some of the other characters, it's a bit more definitive. So would you say both characters have the same... Uh, characters, sorry. Uh, both stories have the same kind of feel? You said uh, just because felt very grounded and uh, 10 centimeters. Is, is it like comparable in that regard? Do they go for the same kind of tone? Mm. Or is one more, I don't know, more comedy hijinks than the others? Or one, you know... More, you said you said uh, ten centimeters is more straightforward in terms of its its romance. I so. guess when you think about it, it kind of needed to be just because it, it, you know, it didn't have the extra six or seven or however many episodes mm. to help it out. Um, but like I said, these shows felt 
you know, even though they had their moments of levity here and there, they still both felt a little more rom than com, as it were. So a bit of teenage angst here and there and a bit of uh, <laughs> a big dose of emotions and then some comedy on the side. Yeah, pretty much. So like ultimately, which which show do you prefer? Hmm. Nah. I had an answer in mind, and now that I'm thinking about it again, I'm not sure, just because both of these shows had their strengths. You know, the the wide and different areas, cause, because, you know... Mm. Well, it comes down to what you weigh more heavily, I guess, then. What what is more important to you? Or yeah. do, you, do you feel like that one show is strong enough in another department to, like, even out the field? Yeah, I mean, you know, 10 centimeters obviously has the... Uh, stronger production but just because it has the stronger writing and character interactions so i sort of feel like the lat it the that makes the latter the stronger of the two shows it sort of makes me wonder what would be if somehow we could like merge the two productions together and see <laughs> what would happen to both shows yeah get it it, it sounds like getting uh, uh, just because with the production values of 10 centimeters would be like the best outcome there. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, if, if you watch the movies uh, eventually that, you know, relate to 10 centimeters, maybe you get a bit more expansion on, on, on the writing there and the character development. And maybe that will, again, make you back, uh, go back and maybe value that <laughs> one a bit higher. I don't know. But, but you know, j just judging from the overall impressions on your end it sounds like if one is into uh you know teen romance stories uh it is they could easily watch both shows and enjoy them right false is a gem and I don't mean that she has a precious personality, that too, uh, but she's also a literal living jewel. Phos is short for Phosphophilite, and uh, she inhabits a world devoid of humans or animals besides jellyfish for that matter, if I'm not mistaken. Living on an island surrounded by a vast ocean, she and her many other mineral sisters, like for example Diamond, Jade or Bord, are supervised by the mysterious monk Master Congo. Most of them have to spend their days fighting off the mysterious race called Lunarians, who apparently descend from the moon on a regular basis to smash and steal away any living gemstone they can get their hands on. For what purpose? Nobody really knows. Foss, though, is not a fighter. She is k kind of a lazy airhead who doesn't have a proper role among her brothers and sisters yet, mostly because she sucks at everything and is very brittle and breaks easily. On a fateful day, Master Congo decides to task her with the creation of an encyclopedia of their world. Fos is a bit reluctant at first, but after seeking out the help of an outcast among her kind called Cinnabar, she is determined to find something better to do for a new friend than to endlessly wander the night. But for that, she must better herself and find out everything about her world she can. So, this story is based on a manga by Haruku Ichikawa, that manga is still running. We'll get to that later. But yeah, uh, the show is produced by Orange, who I've mentioned before in this show, uh, because they've done a lot of CG work in anime. Uh, recently, Night's Magic, John's favorite. Uh, mm -hmm. Night's and Magic, sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Majestic Prince, a show we both liked, I think. Um, yeah. Active Raid, which was a mixed bag. Um, yes. Ghost in the Shell Arise, Tiger and Bunny. And what stood out most to me in a lot of CG segments from those shows uh, they worked on is how comparably fluid and well choreographed a lot of the CG action scenes in those shows were. Majestic Prince is still a standout in that regard, has a lot of great fight choreography, uh, a lot of standout cam camera work. But as far as I can tell, uh, this one, Land of the Lustres, is their first full CG show. And it looks surprisingly good. I say surprisingly because, as you all know, I'm not a fan of CG in anime. Quite the opposite. But if more shows looked like Land of the Lustrous, I wouldn't be as down on that part of anime as I usually am. 
Um, the characters emote a lot and very well, in my opinion. They don't feel like lifeless dolls most of the time. Of course, there's some jank here and there and some stiffness. Uh, I'll, get to, I'll get to that, but it's negligible. The show is really colorful and you got some nice effect work on the environments and the character's hair. Uh, that also stood out to me. It's all very shiny and sparkly. And it doesn't feel like overkill. It feels like uh, it belongs in the look of that show. Uh, it's just pretty and, and clean. It, it looks like a very... It's a very neat look. The show actually managed to craft a lot of landscapes and scenery that I haven't seen before like that in anime. It has, of course, because it's CG, it has like this three-dimensional feel to it. And um, there are these big sweeping zooms and pans that happen on a constant basis because of more freedom with the camera work on everything. And that gives that gives the show a feeling of scale at times that I don't necessarily get from a lot of other shows. And that makes it, yeah, it, it makes it feel like a small part of a really big world we can't quite gra get a grasp on yet. And that's interesting. And that, that gives the show like a, a pretty neat atmosphere. And I would say the uh, CG contributes to that. Going back to what stood out most to me when it came to Orange's uh, animation in uh, their other works, the action scenes. Uh, episode 10 of Land of the Lusters is a showcase for what is possible in fight scenes if you use the advantages of CG correctly. Uh, one of the characters' hair movement alone in those scenes is mind-bending, uh, but there's so much fluid movement in general, so much great camera work and action choreography, it's a blast to watch. And um, even if you don't want to watch the whole show, uh, if you're an action guy or girl, I recommend you checking out at least the 10th episode to see what is possible with CG in anime. Uh, if there's someone at the helm who knows what he or she is doing. Um, and in this case, that would be uh, Takahiko Kyokoku, who directed this show. He also directed Gate and Love Life, at least the first season, I think. But was also an episode director on uh, Excel World, uh, mm. Star Driver, Gundam Unicorn, and Space Brothers, among many other things. So, John, you are partially familiar with this work without maybe knowing it. It's true. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, direction in this show is great, not only in the fight scenes, but also in the quieter moments. Uh, all the characters have a lot of personality, everything in the world feels alive, even though it kinda isn't, because, like I said, the Gems and Master Congo are pretty much the only thing inhabiting this world. Um, like I said, there's some jellyfish in the water, and yeah, sometimes <laughs> elsewhere, this is weird enough, and of course there's the life coming from the moon and everything. But other than that, it seems to be kind of a dead world, but it doesn't really feel like it. It feels like at least lived in uh, at some point. And yeah, and um, the camera is moving a lot, thankfully, because why would you use CG if you don't make use of its benefits over traditional animation? Uh -huh. So yeah, um, <laughs> it's great stuff. To be fair, episode 10 is kind of the only episode in the show that looks that good. Uh, that's why I said it's a showcase. But the rest of the show is fine. It's good. It's just that in a lot of other scenes in the show, you have some of the usual stiffness and choppiness inherent to anime CG in it. Mostly because of the limited frame rate that they use. You know, it for some reason, I don't know why they still do that, but they do. Or, or because of the character models themselves. But it is more negligible than in pretty much all the other um, CG shows or the CG stuff and other shows I've seen until now, <laughs> especially Berserk, which I, need to comp which I need to compare to this because it's the only other full CG show that I completely watched. So, but yeah, good stuff. I think the only CG on that level I've seen in anime before that has this specific, the specific cell shaded anime look and it's that fluid was in um, the recent Dragon Ball and uh, One Piece movies who have made use of that kind of and I want I don't know I don't think Orange worked on those I think that was Toei all the way through but uh, I'm not sure and that also stood out to me as something really good there are some fight uh, fight fight scenes in um, One Piece movie uh, Z. Mm, that stood out to me in that regard, where they made really good use of CG and camera movement and uh, had the characters do some crazy things. And they definitely used the same stuff in uh, Dragon Ball Fighter uh, Battle of the Gods, 
for at least one scene. So yeah, the stuff you've seen in those movies is comparable to uh, the fight scenes in Land of the Lustres. So yeah, um, the soundtrack is also great. Uh, this is another name that will be familiar to you, John, because it's done by Yoshiaki Fujisawa, who we have mentioned on the show before. He did music on Love Life, mm. uh, Vatican Miracle Examiner, Gate, Dimension W, and currently A Place Further Than the Universe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, in this case, it's mostly uh, minimalist piano-heavy music, but that works really well with the tone and atmosphere of this, of this story. Uh, it's funny when foes and her sisters are goofing off, threatening when the Lunarians attack and exhilarating when the fighting commences. Uh, I really liked the music in this show. It felt very appropriate. Story-wise, Land of the Lustres or Hoseki no Kuni, so basically Land or Country of Jewels, <laughs> I guess, uh, is an interesting beast. Because on the surface, there is not a lot of plot to go around. The story is mostly about foes trying to build that encyclopedia in the beginning, then some things happen to her that make her change gradually, both in appearance and in behavior. And by the end, she decides to question Master Congo about the Lunarians and the rest of the world. So that is pretty much all that happens during the course of the 12 episodes in terms of plot development. Uh, we haven't really learned that much about the world and the Lunarians by the end. There are some tidbits dropped about the possible history of the world by a certain character at the midway point, I think, episode six or something of the show, but it's all kind of vague and doesn't amount to a lot yet. So um, as someone who loves his show's plot driven, you would assume that left me kind of disappointed with the show, but I kind of loved it. <laughs> oh, yeah? Um, yeah, I really dug this show. Yes, I know, CC loving a full CG enemy. It's the end of the world. Cats and dogs, mass hysteria, all that good stuff. What is happening? <laughs> what is... No! It's all coming to, end, uh, to an end. But seriously, um, I was enthralled by the show's world, atmosphere, and characters from beginning to end. Foz is a really nice protagonist. Uh, like I said, she is a lazy goofball in the beginning and very sympathetic. And even though she overcomes some of her character flaws, she never completely loses, uh, loses that relatable, sympathetic side of hers. So by the end, she is a much more competent fighter and competent person in general for several reason, uh, reasons, but she is not a completely different character. Her development doesn't ever, doesn't ever feel forced, even though a lot of different outer forces are responsible for her change. It felt very natural. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed, um, you know, following... That character's journey throughout this 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 uh, first series. Speaking of which, what left me a bit confused for a while was the role of Cinnabar in this series, because considering how important she is in terms of being one of the main driving forces behind Foe's development in this show and her motivation for continuing on her path, Cinnabar is barely in this show. She appears in a few important moments, but we have learned very little about her until now and spent very little screen time with her, which felt weird to me. I remember when I watched the first episode and talked about it for a sneak peek, I said that, ah, okay, these two characters who are kind of outcasts uh, in their society for several reasons uh, will form a bond and they will become friends and then they will go on a journey and stuff like that and learn more about each, each other and themselves and that's how it's going to go. And I expected that to happen, but that's not not really what's happening, at least in the first 12 episodes of the show, because, you know, like I said, Cinnabar is barely in it, and this is mostly just Foe's story. Cinnabar is the instigator and, you know, the motivation and the driving force behind everything, what Foe's does, but they don't really meet that often. They don't come face to face. Uh, face. And, yeah, that's that, was, that felt just weird to me. I, I expected uh, Cinnabar to play a more prevalent role. But at the very end of the season, I felt like we have reached the point where she and Foz finally become the team they were destined to be from the beginning. And yeah, what I assumed would happen much faster than it did. Now, I hope we get a second season to actually see them in action together, because a lot of the first 12 episodes felt like a prequel to the actual story, to their story, and to the plot of the show. 
So yeah, I, I know I said I wasn't disappointed with this show, but this all comes with the caveat of me hoping for or expecting the story to continue in a second season, especially considering that the manga is still running. So yeah, I, I really want that now. <laughs> I need that. So I hope it's going to happen. <laughs> but again, as a prequel to the actually bigger uh, bigger picture story, this, these 12 episodes work really well. Uh, we get really neat world building, at least on a character basis. Uh, the mythology feels rich and open enough to hold a lot of potential for the future for future developments. Uh, we get to see a lot of vistas and landscapes we want to know more about because they look gorgeous. It's all really neat stuff. And the gem people are also really interesting. They are genderless, though most of them look and act pretty girlish, at least in a classic sense. A few lean more towards being boys, but the series doesn't really settle on either classification. Um, sometimes, I th if I'm not mistaken, they say, uh, talk to my sister or talk to my... And sometimes they say, talk to my brother. Uh, it doesn't feel like uh, the show, you know, decides on <laughs> fully on either of those. The One of the most interesting things about uh, those people is they can be reassembled if they you know if they are shattered and their shattered pieces are being collected instead of being taken away by lunarians so they are practically immortal you know the shattered pieces are brought back to the uh basically the house doctor uh of this of this land which is rutil and she reassembles the characters and then you know they can not walk normally again and act like they have always acted that's convenient and look like they have always looked yes so yeah like i said they are practically immortal and thus don't really have a grasp on the concept of death mm -hmm. um however if they lose portions of their body for good they also lose the memories stored in those body parts which of course becomes a plot point in the show and is very interesting likewise it seems if they incorporate new types of minerals different from their own natural makeup into their bodies they gain new character traits and physical features at least that's happens to uh, that's what happens to one of the characters in the show uh, which is also linked to her psychology in an interesting way. So yeah, the show does a lot of interesting things with, you know, the whole setup of the main characters being minerals, basically, or anthropomorphized uh, versions of of minerals. So yeah, uh, I, I really liked it. I really liked that, that, that this wasn't just, you know, a, a fancy, uh, I don't know... <laughs> A, f a fancy setup just uh, for, in terms of outward experience and hey look these characters look like shiny games look what we do with our neat CG and everything no they incorporate all of that uh, story wise and uh, make this something very unusual and something I haven't seen before and uh, it feels like the creators of the show or the creator of the manga I guess really thought about how that would affect these these beings uh if they are made up in that kind of way and uh you know and how that would make them change and uh, uh you know affect them in different ways so yeah cool stuff definitely there's enough interesting st uh things in this show to see and experience even though it's like i said a bit light on plot for now but force is cool many of her sisters slash brothers are cool like, for example, Diamond, Rutil, Jade, uh, and Artisite. Character-wise, this show is a treat. Even though Fos and maybe Diamond and Board are the only ones that get some real major uh, development for now, the other ones are mostly there for to increase the liveliness of this world, to make it feel like, okay, this is a bunch of people living in this world, and, you know, a bunch of characters that act, interact with each other on a regular basis, but a lot of them you know, are just there to be, uh, I guess, side characters and side government. Uh, but all of them are fun, and there's enough potential for the future in the, cast, in the cast and in the world and mythology that makes me really wish and hope for a second season now. So if you are like me and don't like CG in anime and skip the show for that reason, I'd say maybe give it a chance after all. Uh, I think the show deserves it. It succeeds where a lot of other CG shows failed and everything else it has to offer is engaging and promising too. So yeah, definitely recommend it. Go and check it out. Yeah.
Right, so now that that's out of the way, we get to go back to uh, Goofy Nonsense with uh, Blend S. Mm-hmm. Probably one of the most memed shows of this season. Uh, so Blend S uh, centers around... Is it? I must have missed that. Well, I'll get to that. Don't you worry. Mm-hmm. Um, so Blend S centers around this girl, Micah Sakuronomiya. And she's having a hard time finding a part-time job because... Uh, when she smiles, she looks super scary and creepy because she doesn't know how to just, you know, put on a proper smile. <laughs> I know the feeling. Uh, she's scouted one day by this Italian man who claims to be the manager of a restaurant uh, named Stile. This uh, maid cafe, you know, where all the waitresses are given unique character traits. Uh, and Micah... And so finding yourself with the trait of a sadist. How nice. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's, it's it's weird how we sometimes just fall into these roles. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, she works alongside. I, other... I have a shitty smile, but I don't want to be a sadist. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, she works alongside some other girls who end up taking up the uh, roles of, like, the little sister, the tsundere, the, uh, in th- that sort of stuff. So it, this show comes out swinging with its goofiness, and it just it, it does not stop. Um, now, I say the show got memed into the ground because of... <clears throat> Smile, sweet sister, sadistic, surprise service. Uh huh. And, you know, that went around for a few weeks, and it was an, an unending source of entertainment for me. I, I made one of those videos myself, which, uh, if you dare to dig through my Twitter, uh, I'd have to dig it out myself because it was several months back. I, I I had fun with that, and I make no apologies. But yeah, this, Good. Sh- <laughs> this show is, like, unapologetically goofy. And it's uh, animated by A1, who I we've talked about them enough that I don't think mm-hmm. we need to ramble off the shows that they worked on. It, it definitely has its uh, similarities to working. So there you go. And that's what I thought when I heard the synopsis. I was like, okay, this is... This this has got to be John. John probably checked this out because of his uh, fondness of working. Yeah, I mean, there's like no. I don't think there's much crossover in terms of staff, most because it, it's a different uh, person who created it, by the name of Miyuki Nakayama, and this is their one big work to date. It, this show has at least a pretty diverse cast of characters. So you've got Micah. She uh, is looking for a part-time job so she can make money and maybe someday take a trip to America. Because uh, long story short, Micah is basically a reverse weeb. I mean, the, those people exist, I guess. <laughs> they, they do. They do, apparently. Uh, and... You know, the restaurant manager, Dino, is very Italian. So that sort of, I guess, vindicates her want to go see some, like, you know, not just exclusively America, but like, you know, Western uh, culture. Uh, and Dino is is pretty much the weeb to her reverse weeb. Because mm-hmm. they... Oh, why are you so tired, Mantra? Oh, I stayed up late watching anime. Oh, okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, we've got um, this girl, Kaho. She's, you know, the uh, Sundere girl that everybody loves. Like, if you look up fan art for Blendess, she's constantly there. Uh, Why she, is that? Because she's the character that everyone loves. She's... Uh, super huge into her video games. She's constantly playing uh, this one rhythm game on her phone during breaks. And she, like I said, this show just takes, you know, these uh, these goofy things and runs with them for each character. Mm-hmm. We've got uh, Mafuyu, who's just 
she's given the role, like I said, of you know of the characters I described earlier of a uh, little sister, and she is short in stature, but she is much older than her outward appearance lets on to be. So she ends up being like the, uh, I guess not really the mother to the group, but more of the you know keep your shit in check sort of character. <laughs> Because there comes a point where uh, Dino is very enamored with Micah, and that becomes the focal point of the show. And <laughs> there's moments like, "What are you doing, hitting on her?" I'm calling the police. No, don't, it, don't, don't actually do that. Is is it like? Is it literally funny or is it creepy? It it kind of skirts the line. Mm, okay. Um, As in many anime. Yeah. And a couple of the other characters are uh, Akizuki, who's basically the uh, cook who runs the kitchen. And they kind of try to uh, put him and Kaho together. I say try for a reason that I'll get to in a minute. Hmm. Um, And then there's a character that they introduce later on uh, named Hideri. And I don't want to give too much away about Hideri, but the character is funny because... They're voiced by Sora Tokui, and if you're familiar with her, then you probably have watched Love Live and know who uh, Nico is. And it's basically the same character, which I found unendingly funny because she she just plays the same character to the letter. And I was like, yeah, no, okay. Um, I mean, I haven't watched Love, uh, Love Live, so that would be lost on me. Nico, <laughs> But what's what's her what's her given character trait? Nico is very. Um, very self-confident and up on herself like i'm just so great aren't i and it's like okay you're one of those mm -hmm. okay <laughs> so the fact that the i'm sure the voice director was like yeah just just play this character the exact same way got it <laughs> so the show is fun because it's uh goofy it's it's uh one of the few a1 shows that's not sword art or working that's well animated I'm just gonna throw that that's out a plus there. <laughs> um I, f i mean i mean um, like i said magi and nanatsuno taisai are very well animated too just not in all episodes <laughs> let's say in maybe one Let fourth Yeah, let me <laughs> let me rephrase that. It is one of the more consistent shows of theirs. All right, <laughs> but yeah, um, what I was saying earlier, though, um, this they sort of you know drill into your head. Oh, we're putting Micah and Dino together. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that cute? And it's like, okay, how about the other characters? Because it gets to a point where it's like. I, I want to see more of the other characters interacting, and that doesn't really happen as much as I would like. Mm. So it's this show sort of loses its novelty and its spark because of that. That's a shame. Which I don't feel like makes it an outwardly bad show, but it does make it tiresome after she is maybe the first half uh, of the show's runtime so are there any like i don't know any things that redeem it that make you that made you want to keep going or was it just a hope that things would change again there's a dog yeah, okay that's good. that's a good start <laughs> um the one of the characters finds this dog that you know It's a stray. It doesn't have an owner. So they sort of take it in and they name the dog manager. Okay, sure. Why not? <laughs> so the store has two managers, effectively. Isn't that funny? Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, that's that's at least there to uh, break things up, make it more interesting. I don't know. Th this show, I would hesitate to call it super interesting because, you know... Once you've seen a few episodes of it, you've you've basically gotten the experience. It's it's, okay. it's very it's very episodic in nature, I guess. Then, so it's like okay, this is like this is like a, a, a sitcom that you could like tune in at any moment and would get a grasp on what it is. Pretty much. All right. 
It's, it's well, not... how much how much how much proper comedy do they get from the gimmick with the with the different character personalities that come, you know, that that are employed in this uh, in this cafe? I'm 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 glad you asked that because I wouldn't have thought to bring it up. They do touch on that a bit because there are moments where they tend to break character and have trouble maintaining their roles in the um restaurant and i feel like you know that's that's real sometimes you just have trouble you know keeping up this uh facade you're supposed to keep on for the sake of your job and you know that it, it's tough so uh, i i thought that was uh at least you know somewhat funny that uh, and, you know, obviously, uh, Micah is always going back and forth about, you know, her role as a sadist. Like, am I being too mean to the customers? What do I do? I'm not sure how to act. And, you know, they they eat it up. They love it <laughs> because it, because it is, you know, a made cafe. And that's, you know, how they're supposed to be. Well, at least she seems to be talented. So I guess there's that. Yeah, I mean, un unwittingly and undesiringly so <laughs> i mean if you've got a talent if run with it i guess <laughs> yeah this show i talk about so many slice of life shows like this and romance ones that it gets hard to really say much more than it is just because like like i said this needed more character development on the uh, side characters for me to for me to be able to say, yeah, I could recommend this if uh, if you're looking for this. I, I would just say watch Working instead because it has a larger cast with better developed characters. Especially, you know, considering the fact that it ran three seasons and, you know, th it had that advantage that it was a larger, more popular property. But that's not really an excuse, you know, because nah. like we... Like we mentioned before, or like you mentioned in the previous episode, I think that it's amazing that some of the shows that have a shorter runtime manage to do a better job at, you know, characterizing their protagonists than some of the longer shows do. And, you know, I, I guess Blend S had enough episodes to achieve that, just like Recovery of an MMO junkie did, mm. uh, but didn't, <laughs> Di like, didn't achieve that. So uh, even though they should have been able to, but I guess the the emphasis or the focus what was put in a. It's uh, more like they spent too much time on one certain thing and forgot about everything else. And that one certain thing didn't really get uh, uh, developed to you know to an interesting point, or so it, that's what it sounds like. It wasn't really super meaningful. No, well, that's a shame. I mean, the gimmick sounds interesting enough. It's like you can do something with that. You can, you can make a lot of, you know, funny things happen with that gimmick, and you know, also character development. You know, characters stepping out of their constant uh, comfort zones, becoming completely different characters, and discovering things about themselves, and you know, maybe improving themselves or becoming, uh, you know, people that they themselves are more content with. It sounds like that was something that you could do with that. Mm. But apparently the show wasn't interested in that. That's a shame. Yeah, it, 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 I would have liked for it to branch out a bit more like that, but they, they had their one goal in mind going into this, or the director did anyway. I'm not sure what the creator had to say about that, but, um, uh, let's talk about that anyway, about the, some of the staff. Uh, it was directed by Ryoji Masuyama, who's done what his, I believe his big name work was, uh, Gurren Lagann Parallel Works. Mm -hmm. And then he did episode direction on stuff like, uh, The Idol Master, uh, Is the Order of Rabbit, Occultic Nine, which, uh, you seem to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and script that poor disfigured girl with her boobs that were bigger than the rest of her body. Yeah, that was that was worrisome to be honest. <laughs> Every time I looked at that character design, I was like, you "Sure, you shouldn't." Is your back okay? Yeah, I was about to say it looked like a shitload of back pain. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the scripting was done by a couple people, uh, Yako Morimachi, who didn't have any other credit to their name. So 
and then Go Zappa, who worked on stuff like Beatless, which I think is that coming up or is that running this season? Either I don't way, remember. Uh, worked on Idol Master Cinderella Girls, Valkyrie Drive <coughs> Mermaid. What an experience that show was! <laughs> oh my god. And Did you finish that? No, I got oh, one right. episode in and I was like, so long. I thought so, because I remember you talking about it, but I don't remember a lo- you talking about it a lot, so it couldn't have been a trash star, so you probably only watched one episode. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. Like, fan service is fine. Oh yeah. But... It is. <laughs> you, you gotta... You gotta have a bit more than that. I mean, let's... Well, let's uh, break it down a bit, because Valkyrie Drive Mermaid was based off of a game, uh, and the game, not of the same name, it's like Valkyrie Drive like, <laughs> Bikuni or some some weird-ass name. Um, and the person who birthed that game out of their head was one Kenichiro Takaki. If you know that name, you probably know Senron Kagura. Ah, okay, that explains everything. So it was him sort of taking his idea and dialing it up even further. I mean, we get to talk about, we're going to get uh, to talk about the virtues of fan service in the next season, I promise you that. Mm-hmm. It's a certain show I'm watching, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Look forward to that, everyone. Anywho. The last rating credit uh, Go Zappa has to their name is Yu Gi Oh! Zexel Season 2. And we all know how I feel about Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel, <laughs> so let's move on to the music. You love the music, as we've come to know. <laughs> it's true, it's true, because Konish is an amazing composer, and I wish he had more work. Just, just keep On better it. shows. Well, you know, he did the music in MMO Junkie, and that was really good. Yeah, so. okay, that's true, yeah. So On more better shows. Yes. <laughs> uh, the music in this show, however, was done by Tomoki Kikuya, who's done work on stuff like uh, Hidamari Sketch, Inazuma Eleven, and Squid Girl. So, you know, we have these people who... I liked some of the music in, in Inazuma Eleven. I haven't watched it, but I've heard... It. Why would you I, if you I, don't like soccer? Yeah, I mean, I've seen <laughs> bits of it, and some of the super moves, as it were, yeah. that they do are yeah, yeah. just... That's what like, they are. They are crazy. Yeah, they are crazy. They're fucking penguins coming out of the fucking ground and attaching to the legs of the players when they shoot the ball. No, that's normal. It's just fucking... <laughs> that show is nuts. <laughs> but I enjoyed what I watched of it. So, Yeah, and, and I know that, that series has about a million fucking video games, so... And now a lot of seasons, too. I think at least three, so... Uh, it's one of those shows that... Also, uh, Card Fight Vanguard, did I forget just how long they've been running? Like, I think Vanguard has, like, God, five or six series now, and it's like, holy jeez. I mean, I guess you could say the same of Yu-Gi-Oh!, but it has, Yu-Gi-Oh! hasn't been one big, long story thread. It's just been, you know, one story, and then a different story, and then another story, and it's always been different characters. Uh, with the exception of Arc 5, but, you know, that was sort of a weird exception that ended with... A, a weird exception of a show that ended with a wet fart. Okay. Yeah, the, I didn't like the end of Arc 5. Moving on. Uh, geez, I'm not sure exactly what else to say about Blendess other than, you know, what what you see is mostly what you get. and I mean, it's not... An inherently bad show, but like I think when I said that it gets tiresome earlier is probably the best way to describe it. Um, it sounds like they're like rehashing like the one joke, or at least they concentrate too much on that one pairing. And when you get tired of that, the show doesn't really go anywhere to compensate for that. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's. It's fine if you have a show that, you know, is an episode by episode basis, but you got to do other things with the, you know, your characters along the way. If you want to get the full Blend S experience, you can watch the intro sequence and understand that, you know, that's not fair to me to say, because the intro sequence is actually 
for all the memery that went around about it, it's really fun. It's a really, you know, bouncy, cute song. And it, it get it really got the hooks to me. I was like, oh, this looks, you know, fun. And then I was ultimately very let down. So watch. Hey, that fun. sounds like one of our other favorite show gamers. Uh <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's true though, because the opening to games is fantastic, and yeah, the show is. doesn't live up to that potential. So, how many other shows you know reference PUBG in their intro sequence? Jesus, that was the biggest letdown in the opening for me. But <laughs> yes, but <laughs> yes, but the Mario reference was great. Uh... <laughs> but yeah, if if you're interested at all in this show, I mean, watch the intro sequence and then go watch Working. Yeah. Sounds like working is the better choice here yeah. for your for your mate enthusiast enthusiasts. Well, I mean, not even that working as you know maids. It's just you know a restaurant setting with actual interesting developed characters, and, and that's the takeaway. And that's the takeaway for me anyway. That you know, I I want to know more about these characters other than oh, Dino and Mike are so into each other. Great. What else? And that is a wrap on the 46th episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jake Kaufman. Please go to vlt.bandcamp.com and check out his awesome work. Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting animebrainfreeze.com for some interesting articles linked in our episode release posts. Follow us on Twitter at AnyBrainFreeze. We tweet regular updates and fun anime-related stuff there. Leave us comments and questions on Facebook and on our YouTube channel, or send an email to AnimeBrainFreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you had a good time, and please join us again on our next show. Macht's gut. So long, everybody. Next time on Anime Brain Freeze. A battle royale gone wrong because the winner is already written in the stars. Fire up your motor scooter, because it's time to go on a journey. And two girls wandering the wastelands of civilization, clinging to each other to retain their sanity. Hey,